Hi everyone, today I want to talk about the numerous advantages of learning English through stories. Now, we all know that learning a new language is not just about memorizing words and grammar rules. It's about immersing yourself in the culture, customs, and traditions of the language. When you listen to an English story, you're not only learning the words and phrases, but also the context and the way of thinking of the people who speak the language. By engaging with the stories, you can improve your listening comprehension, vocabulary, and overall language proficiency. Storytelling is a great way to ease into new experiences or groups, as you don't need translation or complex explanations. Simply share an enthralling tale, and the ice melts, fostering a more enjoyable conversation. In conclusion, learning English through English stories is an excellent way to improve your language skills, develop your creativity, and become more culturally aware. Some funny people I've met The first funny person I remember is a man who sits on a tree branch by the road and shouts at passing cars. He's clearly not all there, but it's amusing to see him yelling at cars. Strangely, he never seems to notice me when I ride by on my bike. He's only interested in the cars. His enthusiastic shouting always makes me laugh. Then there's a man I've seen riding his motorcycle in a peculiar way. He wears baggy shorts and Japanese slippers, and he sits on the motorcycle with only the right side of his buttocks on the seat, while the left side hangs out. It looks like he's about to tip over, but somehow he manages to stay balanced. Maybe he has a big boil on his left buttock, or maybe he just likes riding that way. Either way, it's both funny and a bit risky. Near my house, there's a short, stout man who runs a sundry shop. His body shape and movements remind me of a penguin, but he's actually quite good at running his shop. Despite his penguin-like appearance, I often buy things from him. Lastly, there's a dandy who dresses in the most outrageous outfits I've ever seen. His choice of colors for his clothes is terrible. He'll wear a purple shirt with green trousers and a pink tie, for example. He zooms around on his motorcycle in these loud clothes. He works as a salesman and maybe his eccentric outfits help him get attention from customers, or maybe they just shock them. Pests in the home The biggest pest in our home is the mosquito. There are at least three different types of mosquitoes, some biting during the day and others at night. They come in various sizes but all share one annoying habit, they bite. We use repellents, coils, nets, and sprays to keep them away, but they still manage to sneak in sometimes. I'm quite sensitive to mosquito bites, so I sleep under a mosquito net. Some people don't seem to notice when they've been bitten, but they might not be so lucky if they end up getting malaria or dengue fever. Another troublesome pest is the common rat. These creatures are active at night, searching for food and causing mischief. They'll eat anything, including soap. Leaving food uncovered overnight is an invitation for them to contaminate it. Rats also create nests in hidden corners and chew through floors, ceilings, and even electrical wires. They're a big nuisance indeed. Cockroaches are another nuisance. They crawl everywhere, sometimes even on our bodies. 
These dirty creatures contaminate food and emit a strong odor, making encounters with them unpleasant. There are also pests like flies, ants, moths, and various bugs. While it would be nice to get rid of them, they seem to be here to stay. The best way to keep their numbers down is by keeping the house clean. This reduces their breeding grounds and food sources, making our home a more pleasant place to live. Teacher's Day Once a year, we celebrate Teacher's Day to honor the teachers who spend so much time teaching us many things. This year, Teacher's Day started with a school assembly in the hall where the headmaster gave a speech. Then we went to our classes, not for lessons, but to have fun. My classmates threw a small party for our teachers. Each of us chipped in some money to buy cakes, drinks, and snacks. We rearranged the desks and chairs in the classroom to make space in the middle. We ate, drank, and played games with the teachers. They were all very friendly, and we had a great time. It was a nice change from regular classes. Other classes also had parties. The teachers had to go from class to class to join in the fun. It must have been tiring for them, but they seemed to enjoy it. After all, it was their special day. One class even put on a short play for their teachers. I didn't get to see it because I was busy cleaning up the classroom after the party. Overall, it was a fantastic day. The whole school was filled with happiness. When the bell rang for the end of the day, I felt a bit sad that it was over, but all good things must come to an end. We went home tired but happy. Birds in my garden I live in a bungalow with a big garden. There are many fruit trees, plants, and lots of grass. At first, the garden looks quiet, but it's actually home to many birds and animals, or they visit often. Every morning, I wake up to the loud songs of a magpie robin. The sound is sweet, and I enjoy listening to it until the bird flies away. Throughout the day, I see different birds coming to perch on the trees and plants. Some come to sing or rest, while others come to find food. It's always nice to watch them. I sit quietly, and they do their thing without any disturbance. I've seen orioles, spotted doves, pigeons, yellow-vented bulbuls, minas, fantailed flycatchers, and many other little birds that I can't name. They sing, dance, and show off their beautiful colors. It's a real treat. But there are also pesky sparrows that sneak into the house to steal food. One morning, I spotted a white-breasted water hen sunbathing next to a mango tree. Normally, this shy bird doesn't come out, but it seems like it's feeling the effects of development in the area, as more buildings are being constructed, and wildlife is getting displaced. Some people keep birds in cages to listen to their songs. But I believe birds should be free to live in nature. That way, they can sing their songs naturally. It's wonderful to see them flying freely among the trees. It's not so great to see caged birds unable to move freely. A scary experience. I had to walk through an area with lots of bushes to get to the shop. 
It wasn't too bad, but I had to stay on the narrow footpath and avoid bumping into the bushes. Buying flour from the shop seemed simple enough. It was the closest one, and my mom thought I was old enough to do this errand for her. Suddenly, I heard a growl coming from some bushes. A fierce dog jumped out in front of me, showing its teeth. I froze. I knew I couldn't fight it if it attacked. I remembered hearing that if you stay still, a dog might not attack. It worked. The dog came up to me, sniffed around, but didn't bite. I was scared, but stayed still. After a while, the dog lay down beside me. I thought it was safe to move, but as soon as I shifted, it stood up and growled again. I was stuck. The dog wouldn't let me go. I didn't know what to do. I waited, feeling scared. As long as I stayed still, the dog didn't do anything, but I couldn't stand there forever. My feet started to feel numb. Then I got an idea. The shop was nearby. I shouted, Help! Help! as loud as I could. The dog looked confused, but didn't attack. The shopkeeper heard me and came to see what was happening. The dog, which belonged to him, wagged its tail. He quickly put a chain on it and tied it up. I felt so relieved. The shopkeeper said sorry and gave me a free packet of flour. It was a scary experience. But after that, I never had any more trouble with the dog. The shopkeeper always kept it tied up. Different Eating Habits The way we eat our food is usually a habit, and we might not even notice it. I've observed various ways people eat, ranging from elegant to greedy. My father slurps his soup loudly, which is kind of gross, but we don't say anything because he'd get upset. On the other hand, my mother eats gracefully. It's nice to watch her delicately scoop up food and chew it slowly. I have a chubby friend who eats really fast, gobbling up his food like there's no tomorrow. He eats way more than me in half the time. While he's eating, he's totally focused on his food, barely noticing anything else. After he's done, he burps and pats his belly. It's kind of gross but also funny. Then I have a thin friend who hardly eats anything. He just picks at his food with his fork and says he's not hungry. No wonder he's so skinny. Some people talk a lot while they eat, and food starts flying around. A sharp shut up and eat usually gets them to be quiet, but not for long. How about you? How do you eat your food? Do you eat fast, slow, like a greedy person, or do you hardly eat at all? Do you pay attention to how you eat? The Garbage Collectors we throw a lot of rubbish into the garbage bin every day, and it always fills up quickly. Garbage bins aren't pleasant to be around, they're smelly, and not nice to look at. That's why we're really thankful for the garbage collectors who come and take away all the garbage. They usually come three times a week, and if they miss a day, the garbage starts piling up on the road, attracting stray dogs and other animals. 
It's only when the garbage truck comes again that the problem gets solved. So we can see how important these garbage collectors are. When they come, they make a lot of noise, and sometimes they seem grumpy. But we understand because their job isn't very pleasant. It's dirty and smelly, and they have to deal with all kinds of rubbish every day. I don't know how they can stand it, but maybe they're just used to it. I'm sure they don't love their jobs. Who would? Still, they come regularly to do an important job. On special occasions, we give them gifts, usually some money, to show our appreciation for their hard work. Even though they can be noisy, dirty, and grumpy, we understand that they're doing a job that most people wouldn't want to do. We should make their job easier by putting our garbage in the bins properly and thanking them once in a while. A near-death experience. It was pouring rain heavily as we drove through an oil palm estate. Luckily, my uncle, who was driving, was handling the situation well. Despite the poor visibility, he drove cautiously with all the lights on. As we drove, ominous black clouds loomed overhead, threatening to unleash their fury at any moment. Lightning streaked across the sky, followed by deafening thunder. Some bolts of lightning struck dangerously close, making us all flinch, even with the windows rolled up. Suddenly, a blinding flash of light and a loud crack stunned us. My uncle immediately stopped the car, his face pale with shock. I too was bewildered, unsure of what had just happened. After gathering my senses, I followed my uncle's trembling finger and saw an oil palm tree about ten meters away, split in half and smoking from a recent lightning strike. It dawned on me that if the lightning had hit our car instead, we could have suffered a similar fate, scorched and smoking. With trembling hands, my uncle swiftly drove us away from the danger zone. We had narrowly escaped death, a chilling reminder of how fragile life can be. Preparing for exams The final exams are coming up in just a few months, and it's crucial that I perform well. That means I need to start preparing. I have to review and study all the material I've learned throughout the year. Firstly, I need to make a study schedule to manage my time effectively across different subjects. I'll need to spend more time on the subjects I find challenging. I plan to have two study sessions each day one from 3 to 4 in the afternoon and another from 7 to 9 in the evening. I can't study all the time. I need breaks for games and other activities to refresh my mind. Geography and history are my weak spots, so I'll dedicate extra time to them. These subjects involve memorizing lots of facts so I'll need to do plenty of reading to retain them. It's crucial to read attentively to prevent forgetting the information quickly. For other subjects that require less memorization, I just need to stay updated with them, and I should be fine. Lastly, I'll need to cut back on time-consuming activities like socializing with friends window shopping, and entertainment like watching videos or listening to music. I can indulge in these activities again once the exams are over. Right now, it's time to focus and prepare for the battle ahead.
Punishment in school. I was really surprised when the teacher threw my exercise book at my face. She stood there, staring at me with her big eyes. What had I done? Then, the boy next to me got the same treatment. One by one, the teacher did the same thing to five boys. The whole class was shocked by her sudden anger. We were just kids and were scared of her, especially because she was the headmaster's wife. After that, we were sent to the headmaster's office. The five of us didn't know what we had done wrong, but it seemed really bad. Still, we went into the office. You're all troublemakers, aren't you? The headmaster said. We looked at each other. What trouble did we cause? I hear you never listen to the teacher. You're disobedient, the headmaster said. We tried to explain, but we were told to be quiet. When Chung, my classmate, had his hands in his pockets, the headmaster scolded him and said, Good manners are important. You have none, boy. Chung quickly took his hands out and stood still. Then the headmaster accused us of not doing our work properly, being rude, and noisy, among other things. Most of the time, he was wrong. Our work might not have been perfect, but the accusations were too much. Anyway, each of us got a hit with the headmaster's cane. It didn't hurt much. What hurt was that it was unfair. We were punished for weak reasons, but there was nothing we could do except go back to class and try to get along with the strict teacher. Teachers, good and bad. In my time at school, I've met different kinds of teachers. Some are really good, while others are not so great. The good teachers are the ones who try hard at their job. They care about us and want to teach us well. Even if they have flaws, we still like and respect them. Our class teacher, Mr. Loga, is an amazing teacher. He teaches us English, but he also teaches us about life. He's always patient, easy to talk to and has good advice for any problem we have. We're thankful for his help. But our math teacher is the opposite. He often comes to class half-drunk and smoking. He mostly just sits there and tells us to do exercises without teaching much. Sometimes he doesn't even show up. When he does teach, it's hard to understand him because he's not focused. Luckily, I'm okay at math, but others struggle without proper teaching and need to get extra help. Then there are other teachers who are in between. They're good at some things, but not so good at others. We know what to expect from them so we deal with it. We appreciate the good teachers and try to get along with the not-so-good ones. I don't want to judge the teachers. They live their lives their own way. I wonder what they would say about us if they had to write an essay called Students, Good and Bad. A Visit to a Jungle I got to go to a tropical jungle recently, and it was amazing. My friend Rahim, who works as a forest ranger, took me there. I wanted to see what it was like for myself. As soon as we stepped into the jungle, it got dark. The trees were so tall and thick that they blocked out most of the sky. 
Down on the ground, there were plants everywhere, and the air felt damp and strange. We could hear all kinds of noises, insects buzzing, birds chirping, and animals moving around. Even though we couldn't see them all, we knew they were there. The sounds made the jungle feel spooky. I didn't know how Rahim could find his way through the jungle. He said he was following a path used by the local people, but I couldn't see any path at all. It made me realize how easy it would be to get lost in the jungle. I followed Rahim carefully as we walked. The worst part was the leeches, these tiny bugs that suck blood. Even though I wore thick boots and clothes, they still managed to bite me. I saw so many strange things for the first time, birds, insects, big spiders, snakes, huge trees, flowers, and thick vines. It was incredible to see nature's power up close. When we finally came out of the jungle, I felt relieved. The clear blue sky was a welcome sight. Being outside the jungle felt much easier. The jungle was exciting, but I'm happy to stay out of it. My first acting role The first time I acted in a play was when I was in Standard 3. It was the only time I acted in a play. I got to play the role of a farmer. Roddy, the prettiest girl in class, played the role of the farmer's wife. So I felt happy about my role. We spent a whole week practicing the play. Learning the lines by heart was hard. The first practice was a mess as we kept forgetting our lines. After a few practices, we got better. It was tiring but fun. In the play, I had to pretend to climb up a mango tree to pick mangoes. Of course, we couldn't have a real mango tree in the classroom. So we used a ladder and hung a mango from the ceiling with a string. It looked like a real tree in front. Of the blackboard. Finally, the day of the play arrived. I went on stage, well, in front of the classroom, with my friends, and acted out our parts. Everything went smoothly. We didn't feel nervous because we had practiced a lot and our audience was our classmates. Now, a few years later, I can't remember any of the lines from the play. But I do remember how much fun it was to eat the mango during the play. Crew Cut When I went to school with a crew cut, everyone laughed and made lots of comments. I looked funny, but I had to get this haircut because of something silly I did with my cousin. Usually, I went to the barber every month to get my hair cut. But my hair was getting too long, and it covered my ears. My cousin thought he could save me money by cutting my hair himself. He said he knew how to do it well. So, I let him use scissors on my hair. After five minutes, I looked in the mirror and saw a disaster. My hair looked terrible. I told my cousin but he said he wasn't finished yet and promised it would look good. But it only got worse. My hair was all uneven and messy. So, I had to go to a real barber to fix it. The barber laughed and said the only solution was a crew cut. I agreed, and my hair ended up very short, like bristles, only a few millimeters long. But it was better than the mess my cousin made. 
having a crew cut wasn't so bad. I didn't have to comb my hair, and my head felt cooler. Eventually, the laughter and comments stopped. At the shopping complex. My mom and I took the lift from the underground car park to the ground floor of the shopping complex. As soon as we got out of the lift, we felt a rush of cool air and heard loud music from a nearby music shop. The car park was dark, but the ground floor was bright and lively. We found ourselves in the foyer of the big shopping complex where lots of people were bustling about. There were many shops around, like a goldsmith's, music shops, a pharmacy, book stalls, a video shop, an optician's, and a large supermarket. Two very old guards sat in front of the goldsmith's shop, looking like they were falling asleep. I wondered if they could handle robbers if any showed up. In the middle of the foyer, there was a cheap sale of clothes, and it was packed with people. We couldn't even get close to the clothes, so we walked past the crowd and went into the supermarket. Inside the supermarket, there were rows and rows of goods. We grabbed what we needed and put them in a trolley. Then, I pushed the trolley to the checkout counter, where my mom paid for everything. Luckily, there weren't many people in the supermarket, because everyone was at the cheap sale. After we finished shopping, we left the supermarket and passed by the crowded area again. I noticed one of the old guards was actually snoring. We headed back to the lift and left the shopping complex. A painful lesson. Our bodies are made of flesh and bones. When we get hurt, it hurts a lot. So, we try to be careful to avoid getting hurt. Sometimes, though, we have to learn the hard way. I love running around like most kids do. It's fun, but it can be risky. One day, while playing tag with my friends, I ran down a hill. It was easy to go fast downhill, and I wanted to see how fast I could go. So, I ran as fast as I could. But I ran too fast, and my legs couldn't keep up. Suddenly, I tripped and fell hard onto the road. It was shocking and painful as I skidded along the rough surface. I felt intense pain as I lay on the ground, bleeding from my hands, legs, and face where my skin got scraped off. My friends were scared when they saw me hurt like that. They got help, and I was taken to the hospital. The doctors cleaned and bandaged my wounds, but it still hurt a lot. Every time they changed the bandages, it felt like fire. I learned my lesson the hard way. Running down a hill can be dangerous, and I won't do it again. How I spent the weekend Last weekend was pretty ordinary, like most weekends. I woke up later than usual on Saturday. After breakfast, I went to my friend Arul's house. We spent the morning reading comics. Arul has lots of comics, and I get to read them too because we're friends. We read comics until lunchtime. Then I went home, had lunch and took a nap in the afternoon. Taking naps in the afternoon is something I can only do on weekends since I'm busy with school on weekdays. In the afternoon, I helped my dad in the garden by pulling out weeds and trimming the hedge. 
we worked until it got dark. After that, I had a bath, had dinner, and watched TV until bedtime. On Sunday, I woke up late again. For breakfast, I had cornflakes with milk while listening to the radio. Then I spent the morning doing my homework. After lunch, I took another nap. Later, I finished my homework. By the time I was done, it was already evening, so I took a walk around the neighborhood. It felt good to relax after finishing my homework. After dinner, I packed my school bag and went to bed early to get enough sleep for school the next day. And that's how my weekend went by, just like any other weekend. Turning over a new leaf Ah Kyung used to be the naughtiest boy in our class, maybe even the naughtiest in the whole school. He was always getting into trouble with the prefects and teachers. It seemed like he couldn't go a day without causing some kind of mischief. Our classroom was a mess because of him. Broken windows, desks, and chairs were everywhere. He had even been punished in front of the whole school, but it didn't seem to faze him. Then, one day, Akion's mother passed away. He was absent from school for a week to mourn her loss. When he came back, he was like a completely different person. He looked so neat and tidy that I almost didn't recognize him. And his behavior was different too. He was polite and well-behaved, unlike before. The teachers and prefects were surprised, but they were also pleased. Akiung ah told me that his mother's death made him realize how badly he had been behaving. Before she passed away, he promised her that he would change his ways, and he kept that promise. It was like a miracle, he turned over a new leaf. I'm really happy for him. Now, he's one of the nicest and most reliable friends I have. Memories of a Radiant School Unaware, I stepped through the gates of the Bright School. I couldn't shake the feeling that upon entering these gates, I would transform into a student of light. The campus ambience embraced me with the fragrance of blooming flowers and the melodic chirping of birds. My emotions oscillated between joy and excitement. Realizing I would spend the next three years in this luminous environment, I was determined to savor every moment. Ascending to the second floor, I entered my classroom. My classmates radiated with endless humor, and each face etched a lasting impression on me. Every smile carried an air of enthusiasm, filling me with energy. On the inaugural day of class, my classmates maintained their spirited smiles. The teacher delivered a continuous stream of words, and while some students exchanged whispers, they recognized their lapse in behavior. The teacher commenced with classroom rules, writing guidelines, and the like. I noticed a punctuality common among every teacher at the light school. Even if a lesson was midway, when the bell rang, the teacher would declare, class dismissed. It struck me as peculiar that elementary school teachers tended to prolong class, unlike their middle school counterparts. Perhaps it was a distinction between elementary and middle school teachers. For the subsequent three years, the light school became my destined abode. I treasured the joyous moments shared with my classmates. Our bond was invaluable, and regardless of our paths, we would return to our alma mater where we spent three splendid years. Reflecting on the memories of the bright school, 
every student endeavors to study diligently and reach new heights. Let's embark on this journey, classmates. Three Tales of Life and Death As a tree For a century, I've stood in this world, patiently awaiting the transformative touch of heavy rain greening lonely mountains, fierce storms tearing everything asunder, beautiful castles morphing into barren deserts, charming girls aging into old women, and the ultimate destruction of our world. Then, I become dust, drifting in the universe, embarking on an endless wait anew. A wait for the next world metamorphosis, the next civilization to thrive. As a bird, I've sung my heart out throughout my life, my voice traversing mountains and rivers to reach your soul. Have you heard my fervent longing? My melody dances atop white clouds, resonating between heaven and earth, embodying my pure and sincere soul. Have you perceived it? When my singing and crying cease, I feel my life concluding. Feathers scatter, eyes dim, and my body descends, decaying and emitting a repugnant odor, devoid of vitality. Earth then compassionately envelopes me, whispering to close my eyes and bid good night to this world. As a butterfly, with a mere fourteen days to live, how can I pursue my passions in such a fleeting span? I contemplate soaring across mountains and rivers, frolicking amid flowers and forests. I observe the world's transformations, the ebb and flow of the sea's fortunes. I endure winter's chill, anticipating the arrival of spring, listening to the snow and wind. Alone in the cold wind, no one cares or worries about me. After the fourteen days, my wings lose their luster, colorful scales gently fall with the wind, my once graceful form falters, and I plummet from the sky, settling into a spider's web. I watch the eight-legged creature approach, powerless to resist. Its fangs pierce my body, savoring my brief existence. Eventually, I lose consciousness, and darkness befalls the world. If there's a next life, I wish to be a butterfly once more. Why? I'm not certain. A dream of school memories. I awoke in tears after dreaming about my past moments with classmates. Desiring to return to sleep and continue the dream, it had vanished without a trace. In the dream, I found myself as a shy newcomer, hiding behind my mother on the first day of school. Gradually, I started interacting with my classmates, evolving into an integral part of the class, laughing and playing with friends. My thoughts drifted to the third grade, where I was a lively and naive child. A humorous incident during a class meeting flashed in my memory, where I revealed all the boys' misdeeds, only to be chased by them afterward. Exploring these memories, I chuckled at my past childish actions. Six years had swiftly passed, and I couldn't help shedding tears as I reminisced about our final farewell. Upon awakening, I sobbed recalling a poem about six years of camaraderie, capturing the heartache of parting. I question why farewells were necessary at this moment and place, recognizing it as the hand of fate. Gazing at the gray sky with teary eyes, I pondered the future for me and my classmates. Struggling to meet expectations Despite my best efforts to brace myself for the inevitable, I have failed my exam. I had aspired to embody the equanimity of Su Dongpa, the renowned poet and scholar, in facing life's fluctuations. However, when reality struck, I realized I am just an ordinary person lacking his calmness. 
I had determined not to shed tears, but the bitter disappointment brought forth another stream. I believed that if I held my head high, the tears wouldn't fall, yet they did, scorching my cheeks and dampening my hair. Once, I looked down on the bustling crowd on the street, pitying their apparent lack of passion and joy. Now, I recognize that I am no different, a tiny particle blown by life's winds. I am exhausted, yet there is no respite. People label me lucky and happy, citing my usual success in exams and the love of my deeply caring parents. However, their love has transformed into a burden, heavy on my shoulders, and I find it unbearable. Perhaps my shoulders are too frail, or my will too feeble. I can't meet their expectations, and the fear of disappointing them grips me. Thus, I persist, striving to achieve my dreams while concealing the shooting stars from prying eyes. The Changing Nature of Begging in Today's Society In our society, we encounter two types of beggars. The first group comprises those with stable jobs, stationed in one place, relying on the generosity of passers-by. The second group roams the streets, actively pursuing anyone they perceive as a potential source of support. As the country prospers and the economy advances, some beggars have evolved. They become more discerning, no longer accepting meager offerings. Instead, they set fixed prices, demanding a specific amount as if transitioning from begging to dictating how much people should give. It's genuinely disheartening that, in today's society, individuals in their late teens to middle age, some physically able, choose to kneel for a few dollars. The perplexity lies in why they opt for begging. Why not start anew, work hard, and build a better life? Why embrace a profession deemed unworthy by society and not contribute positively? Even if someone is intelligent, a refusal to work leads to an unfulfilling life. While living without constraints, under the stars, may seem liberating, I doubt many truly aspire to such an existence. Though I can't predict my future, one thing is certain, I won't become a beggar. Despite their seemingly carefree life, adorned in timeless attire, strolling through streets, lying down whenever fatigue sets in, and gazing at the night sky, that lifestyle doesn't appeal to me. I have hands and won't beg for anything. I believe I can construct my stage and radiate as the brightest star in my unique way. To all the beggars, my message is simple, don't relinquish hope. It's never too late to start anew and become a valuable contributor to society. Embracing Thrift and Combating Waste Embedded in our memories is the timeless verse, plowing in the midday sun, sweat dripping down onto the soil. Who would have thought that every morsel on the plate is toiled for? This poem not only teaches us the hardships of labor, but also emphasizes the importance of hard work. Indeed, our ancestors have long considered frugality a virtue of our Chinese nation. However, in reality, wastefulness has become a serious issue. Among our peers, some incessantly pursue new stationery, frequently replacing their supplies. Others yield to temptation indulging in excessive snacks daily. Some constantly compare and boast about their clothing as if it were their most prized possession. 
What is even more disheartening is that waste, for some students, is not viewed as a shameful act, but rather a pursuit of fashion. Throwing away half-eaten meals seems stylish, and discarding perfectly good clothes is considered cool. Additionally, when criticized for such behavior, some students retort, saying, I used my own money for these things. How I dispose of them doesn't harm your interests, so why do you feel the need to intervene? Times have changed, and standards have risen. It's understandable to waste food during meals. There's no need to be so particular. Our country is an agricultural giant, so what's a little bit of grain? Although our conditions have improved, many impoverished children still lack access to education. Numerous unemployed families await better circumstances, and people in disaster-stricken areas struggle to have enough to eat and wear. According to various newspapers and magazines, even affluent Western countries prioritize thriftiness. They have always known how to live within their means. In comparison, our per capita income is still insignificant, yet we have learned to live lavishly beyond our means. While we are young and may not have the capability to contribute greatly to our country or society, we can all practice diligence and frugality. In fact, saving and conserving can also contribute to the nation's wealth accumulation. So let us start with thriftiness. Starting with myself, I will not waste a single sheet of paper, a drop of water, or spend a penny without careful consideration. Embracing the Essence of Youth Youth is not just a phase in life, it is a state of mind. The essence of youth lies not in rosy lips or nimble care, but in resolute will, vivid imagination, and overflowing emotions. It is also a refreshing drop in the fountain of life. This motto, placed beneath the desk of former U.S. President Bill Clinton, serves as a constant reminder that even in his 60s, he continues to live in the youthful phase of his political life. Youth does not necessarily belong to the young, for if one fails to cherish their youth and lives aimlessly, they remain in the bewildering winter of existence, yet to experience the springtime of their life. However, maintaining a positive mindset enables one to possess an enduring spring. As young individuals, we possess an advantage over others. We harbor boundless dreams, passion, vitality, and creativity. Yet, not everyone knows how to make the best use of their youth. Many classmates around us carry their backpacks to school every day, not for the purpose of learning but merely for indulgence, wasting away the most beautiful years of their youth. They might even offer reasons like, I was born inferior to others, so what can I compare myself with? I can only be the bottom of the pack not cut out for studying. God created people equally and bestowed upon them the same capital, youth. Theoretically speaking, there should be no differences among people. However, reality proves otherwise, as various disparities exist among individuals. The reason behind it all lies in whether one cherishes or squanders the capital bestowed upon them by God. Those who make good use of their youth will succeed, while those who waste it will inevitably fail. Youth knows no age limits, as long as we possess a positive heart, 
we can enjoy its fruits. However, we are currently in the prime of our lives. If not now, then when should we strive? We possess the youngest hearts and the most abundant imagination. Seize the capital bestowed upon us by God. Do not say it is impossible, flap the wings of chasing dreams and soar towards a fantastical future. The Power of Choice in Life Life is a long journey filled with countless choices. Those who choose to strive will lead vibrant lives, while those who seek pleasure will find themselves languishing. Choices pervade our everyday lives and stand before us at every crossroad of our existence. Every choice we make bears its own consequences. Imagine if I were to offer you a dazzling diamond and an ordinary glass ball. Which one would you choose? According to surveys, most children would opt for the glass ball without hesitation, drawn by the immediate sensory pleasure it brings. If a child were to choose the diamond, seemingly devoid of much amusement, it would signify an early maturity. Choices always demand sacrifices. Take for example, the story of a fox passing by a vineyard teeming with juicy grapes, its mouth watering at the sight. However, a fence obstructed its path, making it impossible to enter. So, the fox decided to fast for three days, shedding weight to eventually squeeze through the gap in the fence and feast on the grapes. Alas, it ate too much and couldn't get back out. The fox's greed led to its doom. Thus, we must choose wisely and act with virtue, for otherwise, we will bear heavy consequences. Choices should be guided by virtue. In the wilderness, a person lost their way tormented by hunger and thirst. Dragging their heavy feet, they eventually stumbled upon an abandoned shack. The shack had been deserted for a long time, battered by wind and rain, and on the table inside lay a water jug and a spare siphon. The mouth of the jug was corked, and a note rested on it, saying, Pour the water into the siphon first, so others can clean themselves after you, and only then can you drink. The person hesitated upon seeing the note. Should they follow it and help others before quenching their thirst, or should they just drink without concern? Ultimately, they chose to act with virtue and followed the instructions. In conclusion, life confronts us with various choices, demanding careful consideration. Failure to do so will result in shame from others and inevitable adverse consequences for ourselves. The power of choice lies within us, shaping our lives and defining our character. Something Surprising following lessons can be tiring. Waiting for recess feels like forever. The bell rings, one teacher leaves, another comes in. We need a break from this routine. One morning, we were in class when I felt it would be another day of studying endlessly. Then, the bell rang for the second period. The math teacher left. Geography with Mrs. Singham was next. Between classes, we usually talk and have fun for a minute or two. This time, no teacher showed up even after five minutes. We were having fun. 
Ten minutes passed, still no Mrs. Singham. Our class monitor went to look for her. He came back saying she was absent. We cheered. It was unexpected, but we welcomed it. For forty minutes, we goofed around. The monitor couldn't do anything. It was great fun. The bell rang again. Forty minutes of fun felt short but was enjoyable. Once more, no teacher showed up. Another absent teacher. We cheered louder because it meant we were free until recess. We had two hours of no lessons altogether. It was unexpected, but I enjoyed it. I wouldn't mind having more unexpected breaks like this. Improving my English English is used a lot today. It's the top language for talking between countries and in many parts of life. So, it's important to learn it well. If not, we'll be at a loss. The best way to get better at English is to use it as much as I can. At school, English is only used in English class. But that's not enough. So, whenever I can, I talk in English with friends and teachers who can speak it. Reading books, magazines, and newspapers helps too. They usually have good English. We might talk with wrong English and be okay. But printed words need to be right. Reading teaches me how to use correct English in writing and talking, even though sometimes I still speak our local kind of English. Watching TV and listening to the radio also help. English sounds different when spoken by English people, Americans, Malaysians, and others. So, I keep using English, hearing, reading, talking, and writing it. Some friends only hear and read it. They can hardly talk or write it. But I won't be like them. I'll try my best to learn it well. Strange weather. One morning, I woke up in the dark feeling very cold. Even though I had my blanket on, I still felt chilly. I couldn't go back to sleep because of it. So, I put on some extra clothes and finally managed to sleep again. When dawn broke, I found that my nose was freezing cold. While the rest of my body was warm under the blanket, my nose felt like ice. When I got up, I felt the cold air around me right away. It was surprising to feel such cold in the tropics. I checked the thermometer, and it showed 19 degrees Celsius. I thought to myself, well, this is really unusual. Outside, thick mist obscured the sky. This was also unusual. On my way to school, my clothes even got damp from the moisture in the air. It was cold and damp, and the sun was hidden behind the mist. Most of my classmates and teachers wore extra clothes. Everyone seemed to be shivering. As the day went on, it started to feel nicer. The mist still lingered around us, but it wasn't as cold anymore. It was strange to have lessons in such unusual weather. Only around noon did the mist finally clear, and the sun began to shine through. Even then, the air remained pleasantly cool. 
It was a strange weather event, but it was enjoyable while it lasted. It gave me a glimpse of what it might be like in a colder country. It would be nice if we had this kind of weather more often. Places I want to visit Firstly, I'd love to visit the moon. Although it might not happen in my lifetime, it would be amazing to walk on its surface. They say there's no air or water there, and we'd weigh much less. I'm curious to see how high I could jump and how fast I could run. But that's just a dream for now. Realistically, I'd like to explore places here on Earth. There are the seven wonders of the world, like the Pyramids of Egypt, the Great Wall of China, the Taj Mahal, and more. After hearing about their wonders, it would be incredible to see them up close and experience them myself. But before all that, I'd love to visit Disneyland. I mean, who wouldn't? There's so much to see and do there, it would be a blast. Right now, I can't visit any of these places. Firstly, I don't have enough money. Secondly, I'm too young to travel alone, and I don't know anyone who could take me there. So for now, these places are just dreams. Maybe someday I'll get to visit them, or maybe not. Only time will tell. Mm -hmm.